couple of weeks ago on the show, we got back to the great sport of boxing when we spoke to Terra Moana Jr., Terra Moana, and we are now excited to speak to another Australian boxer heading to the Paris Olympics in what is the biggest ever boxing team Australia has ever sent. She has had an esteemed career through the sport, started at a very young age, has gone on to claim World Youth Oceania Championships, just recently qualified for the Paris Olympics by winning gold at the Pacific Games in the Solomon Islands and is a real shot to win gold and create history for Australia at the Paris Olympics. It's a pleasure to welcome to the show Monique Sarachi. Monique, first of all, welcome to Off the Podium. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. I I am so excited to have you here because I actually found out that you are the very first Australian woman to ever represent us in the 50 kilo category at the Olympics. So this is a, this is a big deal. I, I, I didn't realise we'd never been in that category before. Were you aware that you're the first Australian woman to be at the Olympics in this category? I've actually never, no. I did there not you know go. That. You're welcome. There you go. Add it Thank to the so resume. <laughs> yeah, I, I like to kind of delve into the, the research because I was thinking like, okay, what, what's our best we've ever done in the flyweight before? And uh, going through all the years, we, we've never sent one to the Olympics before. So yeah. Uh, Exciting. And I also believe, if I'm not mistaken, that we are sending a female in every single weight division for the Olympics this year, correct, isn't that? Correct, yeah. So this is, I mean, this is a big deal, obviously, with this team. And I obviously want to talk a a little bit about sort of your teammates and everything along the way. But let's start with you, Monique. Let's start with your journey in the sport. I believe you started at the age of six. Yes, that's correct. How do you start boxing at six? Uh, Well, you're not meant to. (laughs) (laughs) I was going to say, usually as a child, I was told not to hit people. So, I mean, this you sound like you had a great childhood. (laughs) I had an awesome childhood. Um, (laughs) So my dad wanted to get um, myself and all my sisters into boxing. Um, When we at our local PCYC here in Canberra and um, when we got there, we were told that the starting age was 10 for boxing. So my dad just lied about my age and got me in at the age of six, actually. Wow. Uh, he, he actually told me the other day that it was five. Wow. So, yeah, but I'm, I'll just stick to six because that's what I remember. <laughs> but, um, yeah, started very young. Um, and I remember just walking into the gym. There was just boys running around everywhere, like, punching each other. And I was like, this is cool. <laughs> and... Um, yeah, that's how I got into it. Just my dad wanted us to learn how to defend ourselves and the rest yeah. is history. That's crazy. How, exactly right. how do you pass off a five-year-old as a 10-year-old? It's not like you're, that, you know, you're trying to be passed off as a seven-year-old. This is like double your age. Yeah. I was actually really small too. So I think they just didn't really think about <laughs> it too much, but I was really tiny. So I don't know. <laughs> wow. Wow, that's that's crazy to, to think that. Did did all your yeah. other sisters sort of stick to, to boxing? Because I believe you've got five sisters, is that correct? Correct, yeah. Um they stuck with it for a couple of years actually. Um maybe five or so years. Um and they all like now I forget that they all have a boxing background because sometimes I hold pads for them or something and I just forget that they know how to throw hands and I'm like, <laughs> oh my god, watch out. But um yeah, no, they, some of them still do some type of um, combat sport like Muay Thai or kickboxing, but um, yeah, I'm the only one that competes. And are you, where are you positioned amongst your other sisters? Youngest, oldest, middle, sort of where are you? Number four. Number, I'm four. number four. Wow. Yeah. Okay, then. So were, the, were sort of your younger sisters then being snuck in as 10 year olds as well, or were they sort of a little no. bit e- <laughs> easy to no. give away? So um, <laughs> the youngest one at the time, Brooklyn, she, um, she just came in and had some fun with it, just chuck gloves on every now and again. But I don't actually think she signed up until she was a bit older when she could. There you go. There yeah. you go. Uh, you mentioned being born in Canberra. Uh, grew up in Queanbeyan, though. Now, yep. my knowledge of Queanbeyan comes from two people, Monique. <laughs> George Lazenby, Australia's James Bond, and Mark Webber as a Formula One fan. Uh, but I obviously know it's a home to many of other notable rugby players and a couple of Olympians too. But uh, can you give our listeners who maybe don't know much about Queanbeyan a, a little bit of, about Queanbeyan and why should we, should we go to Queanbeyan? Should we check it out? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I believe it's actually one of the fastest growing towns, but it's, it's an awesome place to live. Growing up, it was actually had a really bad rap. It was known to have a lot of crime and um, 
like break-ins growing up we were always br- like getting broken into and um it's a bit of a dodgy area but now it's developed heaps and it's such a beautiful place to live i love queen and I, I don't think i'll ever leave this place to be honest because you still train at um, the same gym don't you basically that you started training in, in no no so i've been to two gyms sorry so i right. started off at pcyc um and then that um the boxing there my head coach ended up leaving um to do his own studies and everything and so i actually was home trained by myself for i think about a year wow. because until i found a gym suitable for me how do you home train mom, how do you do that how do you even just, start that <laughs> I just got a bag at home and just went downstairs every day and just started like doing my own training. I was doing it for years, so I knew the rounds that I set or I'd even message my coach and say, Hey, could you write me out a plan for this week? And, um, yeah, I was just really dedicated and I loved the sport and I just couldn't go a day without doing it. So, um, but then I said to my mom, like, no, I need to go to another gym. Like I need to find a gym. And then, I did some research and um, I found Stockade Training Center with Gary Hamilton and um, I went in there and it was a, a perfect fit actually. Great. And then what age yeah. was this sort of when you were, when you found I Gary? I think I was, oh, I th- I'd like to say I was in year nine. So I believe that would be, I feel like I was 14. Right. When I found Gary. Um, yeah. And yeah, we've created a great relationship um, and a great bond since. And you're still with yeah. Gary to this day? I'm still with Gary, yep. Fantastic. Wow, that must uh, add a whole lot more to this journey, which obviously touched on that yeah. get, gets to the, the Olympics. I, just just quickly, can you clarify, is Queen Bean in New South Wales or the ACT? Oh, I'm yes. always New South confused. Wales. Okay. New right. South Wales, yeah. But it's very close to Canberra, right? Like this Very is- close. Uh, Ten minutes, not even, and you're... In from my house, ten minutes, and you're in Canberra. There you go. Because I always just assumed for some reason it was in the ACT, but no. it kind of. I guess it gets confused often that it is right. So yeah, yeah. A lot of people just say yeah, it's pretty much Canberra, but just yeah. claim it. Claim it as part of just Canberra, claim, right? Yeah. I think you know Canberra needs um, some you know more places like because it's just Canberra, right? In the ACT, we we need to expand it a little bit more to kind of extend it into to, <laughs> to go with that. Exactly, exactly. Uh, I mean, that scene sort of when you were going to the gym then and sort of you met Gary and everything along those lines. I mean, around that period, Olympic uh, female boxing made its debut in London, of course, in 2012. So that's when it obviously ultimately made the olympics but what was like how many other females were competing when you were sort of 14 at the gym uh, you know was it a sport that many girls were getting into at that period uh, i think so it's when it started to kick off i believe um but still the participation rate in females across australia was still pretty low um i could never get fights um even to this day i still struggle sometimes to find fights in australia um because the participation rate is still pretty low compared to other countries. But in saying that, it's gotten a lot better. Um, But back then, um, Gary actually had a really good boxer named Bianca Elmir. And at the time I went to Stockade, she was overseas boxing in Italy. And I always followed Bianca as a kid growing up. And I was like, damn, this girl's a beast. Like she was in my weight category. And, um, she ended up being a lifelong training partner and a lifelong friend. Great. Um, yeah. And she um, boxed and trained with some of the best boxers, Katie Taylor. Um, like she trained alongside really, really good boxers. Um, and so having her as a sparring partner, I remember the first day, Gary, I think it was one of the first weeks I was in there. So I was still really young. She just got back from a training camp in Italy in, I found out later Gary just wanted to test to see what my limits were. And I just remember Bianca just like bashing the hell out of me (laughs) and then me just keep going. Like, and I think that's what Gary was testing to see how much I could take. And, and then he was like, yep, you're sweet. And I was like, happy days. (laughs) Great. Pass the test. Fantastic. Cause it is one of those aspects that I think that, um, you often maybe don't think about too much when it comes to women's boxing that, particularly in countries where maybe the participation rates aren't as high, that 
you know, you can't just go and take on a, a, a mailboxer, you know, it's sort of, it's something that you kind of no. need to be able to, to do that. So it's one of the very few sports where that I can imagine is a real challenge and that, that causes you to have to, I guess, seek alternatives. Is it a case of going overseas and trying to find these fighters when you can't find them in Australia? Well, I see growing up, I only ever sparred males. I think Bianca was one of the first female sparring partners I had. So um, besides my sisters, me and my sisters used to spar back in the gym. But, um, yeah, I think growing up, all my sparring partners were boys or ma- like males. So um, I remember, yeah, like it was such a different, sometimes such a different level, but I never – I never complained. I loved it. Yeah, it was it was awesome. Because I was going to say, is that challenging on a level that, you know, you're going on that fighting against males because obviously you want to test yourself. But, I mean, I don't know when you're fighting males, are they trying to not, like, are they going lighter on you? Like, because they don't, I don't know. Like, how does that work in terms of that? Because you want to be able to go to your ability, right? But yeah, you, I guess you yeah. don't want them to hold back either. But they Well, might- we're sparring. I think, um, like you can't fight a male, but, um, you can spar against them and sparring the males in the gym. Like they actually, I feel it's like they had something to prove too, because, um, I don't know. I found, especially now in the gym, um, it's really like, uh, I'm, I'm that athlete going to the Olympics. So they push their, themselves with me so they don't hold back which I actually never even thought about until one year I was sparring an older gentleman and he said to me, like, Monique, I don't think I can hit a woman. And I was like, I never thought of that before because it was never a problem. Mm. Like it was never something that I thought about or no one's ever said that to me before. Like, um, yeah, so in the boxing gym, I guess – yeah, it's always that equality. It was, the guys were never taking it easy. So it's, it's good to hear. It's it's because it, it is sort of like it's that catch twenty two, isn't it? Where I think like as mm. as as men, we're often you know obviously you don't hit women. That's that's Absolutely. you know quite standard. Yeah. So, but then when you get into a, an environment where the idea of the sport is to hit someone, that yeah. it's kind of crossing your mind. But it's obviously good that it's sort of along the way you only really I guess encountered one person that at least sort of said that. So that. That's very interesting. I, I believe, though, growing up, you were obsessed with the Olympics. This is why I think you're, Absolutely, uh, yeah. you're fitting yeah. with this show very well, Monique. I, I, yeah. I read an interview that you did that obviously you loved, you were glued to the boxing, which I want to talk about watching boxing growing up, but you also loved watching athletics, gymnastics, and badminton. You loved watching badminton. I just, I just need to ask you about this. What was it about? Because badminton's an awesome sport. I, I love hearing it's people who are fans sport. of it. What drew you to badminton? Um, I think playing it in school, I remember just, um, it was one of those things we played in school, um, when it was a part of our PE like program and it was so much fun. It was, just, it was, it was fun. And I think, um, seeing it at the Olympics and everything, you're just like, damn, they're really like so much better than like, uh, and this, the actual, like really good athletes. Yeah. So like, um, separating, what we had in school as a fun sport they they're making like an like a career out of it and making it look so much like easier than it is too but also another one is table tennis i yes. love watching the table, te- table yes. tennis it's so fast and they're so skilled and just their like hand eye coordination it's amazing this is this is why like I love talking to fellow Olympic fans because the beauty I find about any Olympic games is yeah we love watching the swimming the athletics the gymnastics the boxing like the ones that you know are very popular but you get to watch badminton table tennis you get to watch these sports no, that in Australia yeah. we never get to watch right and then you realize exactly. these are awesome <laughs> I think that's the thing like we I never see it in Australia mm. and like especially like table tennis and badminton I never see that in Australia too often. Um, so I think it's awesome. And another one's gymnastics. That's one sport that I absolutely love and have so much respect for because the stuff they do, that is incredible. It's, and there's lots of, I guess, parallels in a way to boxing. I know like Harry Garcia, ballet, dancing, like, you know, but like gymnastics, kind of some of the agility and things they can do. I mean, I can almost imagine you can relate to gymnasts in a way. Um, 
Absolutely. A lot of boxers do like to incorporate some form of gymnastics. I remember my old coach or my first coach, Joe Lay, his name was, he loved um, adding some gymnastics S and C towards the end of the session. And it's actually on my bucket list for after the Olympics to get into some gymnastics. So if there's any gymnasts that want to take me on and teach me some things, please. <laughs> <laughs> I'm seeing a collaboration between you and Georgia Godwin here. I think you two can sort of team up, uh, you know, Perfect. <laughs> works, works very well, you know, bump into Simone Biles at the village. You can maybe ask her along to come and have a bit yeah, of a spar be- and, you know. Yeah, yeah, teach her how to fight. She can teach me how to do a front foot. That'd be all right. That'd be awesome. Uh, I mean, the, the boxing side of things, though, watching that during the the Olympics, I mean, for, I'll actually ask you, what was the first Olympics you remember watching to make me feel really old right now, Monique? Um, I think I was always watching, obviously, like going back on YouTube, watching Muhammad Ali at the Olympics. Um, that Like all the older stuff mm. that you get from like old um, respected um, professional boxers, you go back to the amateur days and even Floyd Mayweather, I think that was Atlanta, I'd like to say. Yeah, that. yeah, would have been around there. And, yep. Yeah. Um, Lennox but, Lewis, uh, people like that back in the Rio, day. Rio, I yeah. love the Rio Olympics. Um, I was, I was really like glued to the TV on that one. I remember downloading the 7 app and just binge watching the Olympics all day. Um, and Tokyo, like, I think I was, I actually pushed away from Tokyo a bit watching the boxing just because I was a bit upset because I did get injured before the qualifiers. But I loved watching, um, like, how successful, like, the team was and Harry Garside, like, winning Australia's first medal in years. Like, he's an incredible boxer and someone I really look up to. So I was tracking him and all the Australian guys like throughout the whole, throughout the whole, um, the whole Olympics. But, um, one that really stood out for me was definitely, I'm pretty sure it was the Rio Olympics. I was in school and they had the Katy Perry song playing, um, that she did for the Olympic games. Rise? Was it called Rise? I think it was. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, Yeah. And we were watching the shorts to it in school. And I remember sitting there and I, I think I turned to one of my friends next to me and I was like, I'm going to the Olympics one day. Wow. Like, I'm going to do that. And it just gave me chills. Like, and I'll never forget that moment. It's, I mean, it's a, a, that song gives you chills. It's an absolutely oh, fantastic 100%. song. But I mean, that, that, that's, that's so inspirational because I was going to say, I, like, I read that you had this dream, like your, your one dream oh, absolutely. in the sport was to, to make the Olympics. But they're, they're those sort of light bulb moments I can imagine that really spur it. And, and we're going to touch on what happened with Tokyo. But I mean, at that point, you know, to say to your friends, I want to go to the Olympics, but it could be the next Olympics. Like that must have even yeah. been more like real. Yeah. Well, I think I always wrote down like my age at what Olympic, how old I'd be at this Olympics, this Olympics, this Olympics. So I was really fixated on it. And I think too, I never really got into professional boxing too much. Like my dad loved Rocky Marciano. He loved Muhammad Ali. He loved Mike Tyson. But for me, I was always watching like the Cuban boxers. Mm. And like the amateur style, like it was never professional boxing didn't appeal to me as much as professional boxing. Um, oh, sorry. Professional boxing didn't appeal to me as much as amateur boxing. And, um, so, and obviously you can't go to the Olympics as a pro. So amateur boxing is what I fell in love with. Which I love hearing that because I think we, we talked about this to Termoana a few weeks back about sort of those differences and kind of alternating between pro and, and amateur slash Olympic boxing. But I, I don't often hear a lot of people talking about watching the amateur boxing because it's all like, oh, mm. I'm going to get the main event. I'm going to watch Vegas. I'm going to watch, you know, Mayweather. Yeah. It's all, you know, pomp and pageantry and all that sort of stuff. But, I mean, is there a big sort of level of fandom for Olympic slash amateur boxing outside of people who are competing? Like, are you getting big crowds to these events and things like that because people follow it a little bit differently to pro boxing? I would like to say there's not enough participation to amateur boxing. And I think it's actually some of the best boxers in the world, professional or amateur, compete in the amateurs. So... 
and I think that's something that a lot of people miss out on. And if they watched a boxing one, three, three minute amateur boxing fight, yeah. I think they would understand that the skill is completely different and it's such a different, it's a chess match. It is, I, I would like to say it's more of a sport than a fight. That's a great and way. A that's lot, a great way of describing that's it. That's how I would describe it. Is it's more of a sport than a fight and there's a lot to it. It's, it's, it's kind of like a cat and mouse game, but you have to, you have three threes to win a fight. You don't have over 12 rounds. Say you've lost the first three or five rounds. You've still got, you've still got plenty of time to make it up in professional boxing, but in amateurs you have those nine minutes and that's it. Cause it's so, there are so few sports where there is such a difference between the pro and the amateur. I mean, we're Absolutely, seeing that. Yeah. Over the years, sort of this, uh, the amateur level of the Olympics has kind of gone away, and then you know we're introducing professional athletes. But boxing is uh, probably the one that is such a difference. I mean, I'd like to say wrestling, but I mean professional wrestling isn't exactly yeah. a sport as yeah. such. It's more of an entertainment product. But it's it's yeah, I, I struggle to think of any other Olympic sport where there is such. A difference, and it's so. I, I love that explanation, Monique. When you say one's more of a sport versus entertainment, because I can imagine there are lots of boxers. I mean, Terramoana was giving examples of this, sort of why he would turn professional, why he did go professional for a little bit, then come back, because obviously the money and everything that's involved in that Absolutely. level. But I mean, I can imagine there are some boxers, such as yourself, where going to an Olympics, winning an Olympic gold medal, would mean much more than having a, a main event at Caesar's palace you you know you might get a hefty paycheck but the olympic gold medal is more of an achievement i think for me anyone can be a professional boxer not saying anyone can be a great professional boxer but anyone can go sign a paper tomorrow and become a professional boxer Mm. not many people can say i am an olympian or i am an olympic olympic medalist so you know i think that for me is the big difference and like i've never done the sport for the money I've done it for the love and the passion of it. So that whole aspect of professional boxing, I think never appealed to me. Um, of course, one day, like you, you know, who doesn't love making money off your sport? I think it's something that like we don't get paid as amateur boxers. So yeah, and especially in other countries, you know, traveling around, you see how their government works and how athletes are, I think, um, not treated differently, but they are, some of them are, a lot of them are in the army as such, and they're allowed to box um, and get paid as a, like a soldier or um, a policeman or woman. And you know, I think we don't have that system here in Australia, but in saying that, I think it just makes us a little bit more hungry to be successful too. So those glor- the glory days when Olympics were purely amateur and yet, you know, some of these countries hired them with government jobs so that they are getting paid while they're spending 24 hours a day training yeah. essentially. So, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it is, I mean, it's, it is very interesting sort of that sort of discrepancy that comes from it and, and everything. I mean, just on that, while you're touching about that, um, you know, we're on the topic of it. Do you do things like fundraisers sort of, uh, you know, um, can people, do you have like a GoFundMe page, things like that, that people can support um, you? So us as athletes, a lot of us have gone out and tried to find some sponsorships, um, which I'm very grateful. I've got a really great support here in Canberra. Um, so I'm going to be making some shirts up to try raise some money for this trip. Um, but I've also got um, – a place called no limits group here, a building company in um, Canberra. I've got a a food supply alpha fresh here in Canberra. Um, I've got a rest and recovery center. Uh, It's called reset here in Canberra. And there's, there's more that I need to list off, but uh, (laughs) like even my mechanics, you know? Um, So I'm really grateful. Like they pretty much cover my living expenses. Like um, looks after my food, looks after my car, looks, make sure like I'm able to go train every day and have less stress on me. But um, yes, us as athletes have to go and find that um, and, you know, give up our work or give up our, our studies just to train, you know, two to three times a day, every day and be traveling the world. Um, 
and um, having a conversation with um, like the athletes on the team, we talk about how sometimes, you know, it's, it's, you feel like a burden asking for sponsorship or asking for help, but, and we would, we would love to work. We would love to make money for ourselves, but sometimes it's really hard. Like by the time, you know, you wake up in the morning, you train, then you go home for a few hours, then you have to either do a recovery session or another session. And then you have your lunch and then you, you have to go train again. And then by the time, like, where do you fit in your work sometimes? Mm. So, or your study. And, um, but yeah, would a lot of athletes do, um, go find me pages or create supporter tees, which I'll be doing. Um, and yeah, we have some sponsorships, which is, we're really lucky. Yeah. It's, it's always that the stories that we hear from the athletes on this show, Monique, where, you know, a lot of people think you're an Olympian, you're rich, you know, <laughs> you're, yeah. you're going to the yeah. Olympics, you know, that that's going to be a thing, but 95% of Olympians, it's not the case, you know, as you, as you're explaining yeah. there and, uh, you know, and not to take away from the Emma McKean's and the Aaron Titmuses, uh, you know, but that's not all funded like swimming. They're not all on Harvey Norman ads, you know, it's sort of, it's, it is that case where, you know, that is a thing, but by, by all means, please uh, send us links and everything to your tea. We'll, we'll give him a plug. I'll, 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 I want to grab a t-shirt. I'm going to grab one of Tara oh, Milana's when he's, uh, he puts his up as well. So always happy to support, but by all means, uh, we can uh, we can flick that up on our page. I, I'd love to learn just a little bit about your uh, you're touching on the training there, because you know Tara Moana is in the super heavyweight, and we basically talked to him yeah. about like he can be as big as he wants and as heavy as he wants. Essentially, it's kind of the complete opposite for you. <laughs> um, Absolutely. So when it comes to training and nutrition and everything, like how tightly are you having to monitor everything in uh, in regards um, to maintaining that weight? Yeah pretty tightly like you look at my plate next to Tara Moana's plate and it's a big difference <laughs> um but I'm very lucky that I've got a great support system um at the AIS and they monitor like they've done all my Dexter scans and they're all, always on top of my food and helping me out with what to eat when to eat what to prioritize with my nutrition and making sure I'm healthy at the end of the day not cutting weight like killing myself to cut weight, um, which, and I'm learning a bit more and more about my body the closer we're coming to Olympics. So I'm really grateful for the team behind me. It's been incredible, but in saying that, like, yeah, it is a pretty tight, um, like it's one of the things that we focus mainly about, like mainly on is making a safe weight cut and to perform the best I can at the it's the lowest weight category in the sport. So um, it's uncomfortable, but I wouldn't have it any other way. I don't think it's uh, I perform well at 50 kilos and um, yeah, you have to make sacrifices, but you always do in the sport. I choose to do the sport and I've chosen to make 50 kilos. So that's always in the back of my mind when I'm cutting weight. Um it's all worth it in the end. Um, I was going to say, it's second nature, I can imagine, after a while absolutely. then too. Because, I mean, once absolutely. you make a diet lifestyle change, you sort of, you know, after getting used to it, it just becomes second nature. I think with boxing too, it had such a bad, um, athletes had such a bad uh, relationship with food. And I'm not going to lie, I did too until I got a proper dietitian, nutritionist and um, learned more about my body. And, you know, you don't need to be starving yourself to make weight it's all cutting so much water to make weight. Um, and I think a lot of weight cutting, cutting sports and combat sports have really bad relationships with that. Um, but I think we're slowly learning, like, you know, you don't need to, um, be on death doorstep to make weight, um, and to do it properly. So, um, I'm been on a meal plan for a long time, but it doesn't feel like a meal plan to me. It just feels like a lifestyle, and, you know, a lot of boxers have a reputation of just pigging out straight after you compete. And I think that's the complete wrong thing to do. Um, and over, over time, I've learned not to do that because that was a big mistake that I did growing up is after you, you suppress or you prevent yourself from eating certain foods. So after your fight, you just go pig out. And I think that's one thing that a lot of boxers do. Mm. so over time you learn oh, i'm not going to do that anymore because that makes me feel really sick 
So, and instead I'm going to, you know, have a, a meal that I want, but make it like just one meal or, you know, not a really poor decision meal, <laughs> but yeah. Do you maintain sort of a consistent plan that remains, say, the same between now and Paris or say like during a competition, like the night before your first bout at the Olympics, are you going to be eating differently to what you would have a month before the Olympics? Uh, yes. So um, we do a lot of boxers do an acute weight making um, diet. So you have um, maybe say five or six weeks out, you have uh, a plan set for you. And then say a week or so before the like your first fight, you start your acute weight making phase, which might mean reduce your sodium intake or reduce your fiber intake. Um, re- um, maybe changing to moderate carbs instead of higher carbs, um, or in some cases the opposite, prioritizing carbs and reducing protein just depends on the athlete. Um, but low fiber low residue diets. They're the ones that a lot of boxes I see do and myself included. So it's pretty much, you've got a whole heap of stuff in the large intestine, I'm pretty sure. And by going low res, it's pretty much a kilo of weight that you can cut off by Wow. doing it. But it's um, only good for a short amount of time. You need to start consuming fiber again shortly. So yeah. It's always so fascinating, I think, when any form of diet like and just hearing the ins and outs and no matter what you're doing it for like there's nutritionists have a very interesting job i think they're so they're clever i take my hat off to them always they're unreal yeah it's it's crazy but this is what the thing i whenever we talk to people on this show around particularly the combat sports around weight divisions and things like that and and that because it's just it's always so fascinating to kind of hear the the differences between it you know because i can imagine your diet in that weight category may differ to a taekwondo athlete in the lowest category to a weightlifter. You know, it's sort of, it's always, it's very, very fascinating. And then on the physical side of things, Monique, like what, what's a standard week like for you in the gym? Like how many sessions are you hit, hitting the gym right now between now and Paris? Um, depends where we are in the world, I guess. So um, if we're, if I'm here in Canberra, I'll train twice a day, every day. Um, but Sunday I have the rest day usually, but, um, so I'll be at the AIS in the morning, afternoon at Stockade. Um, that's been my plan lately, but, and then I'll add in some recovery sessions, um, throughout the week. Um, and then you also have like things like non-physical sessions, such as video analysis or, um, just watching over your your previous sparring or your training for the week or looking at things that you can improve on, like sitting down with your coaches and talking to them, um, sitting down with your dietitian and talking to them about the plans or your doctors or even your sports psychs, like um, adding those sessions in. Those are just equally as important as your physical sessions. Um, and then say we're on camp with the whole team, usually with just Australia, we'll do three sessions a day usually. So school boxing or um, bag work in the morning or even a running session. And then mid morning is SNC and then afternoon is school combat. So that's usually our, um, yeah, week is maybe we'll get one day off a week and then, um, with other teams, usually overseas, if we're say for the U S trip that we just went on, uh, it was two sessions a day and we had a lot of, um, competition sparring. So test matches. So we would, a lot of the time we would do our individual session. Um, we'd have our comp sparring, we'd prioritize our comp sparring, just make it as realistic as a fight as possible. And then in the afternoon or a few hours after, we would do a second session. Um, but when you are training with other countries, it's usually two sessions a day. You know, the the amazing thing is, Monique, about just before we started this interview, I went to the gym for an hour and I felt pretty proud of myself. Um, but, yeah. yeah, you just put me to shame. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, my, my one a day, my one a day, I felt so good and here we go, all right? Yep, thanks for that. Um, but, I mean, <laughs> it, it, the thing that you, you touched on sports psych, how important is that for you to, to get the mental side of things prepared because boxing is such a mental sport outside of the physicality of it. So, I mean, how much does that 
help you and and kind of working with your sports psych in the lead up to Paris? Massive, massive. Um, I've noticed a big difference. I was kind of in denial for it for a bit um, in a sense that you're like, oh, you know, boxing has such a persona that you're tough and you don't, you know, it's always had that culture that you need to be tough. You need to be like emotionless and just go in there and fight. And it's such an old school mentality, but the, your mindset is sometimes 90% of the fight. Mm. You've done all the hard work in the gym. You've done every single thing you can inside that gym. So it's all up to you after that, you know? So you, you can't control, like you can control your training, like so much easier than you can control your mental, I think. So why not get that down pat? Why not like, do everything you can to be mentally, physically, and emotionally prepared for your bout. And in terms so, of just that level though, like in between rounds when, I mean, yeah. I always love watching a boxer sitting on their chair, the coach, you know, doing all that kind of stuff. Like what's, what's Gary saying to you? Like, is that, and then does that come into the mental training that you're talking about there? That kind of a lot of that is like, remember this, remember that, like everything you're doing is correct, um, but to remember this side of things. I think with coaches, it's so important to get a relationship where they know what you want in the corner. And over the years, if someone's in my corner blabbing, I'm not, I'm listening to two words, Max. Wow. So, you know, you're just being out there getting punched in the face. All you need, and I feel for me personally, I just need to know if I'm up on the scorecards and just a few pointers or something that the coaches see that I might be doing wrong or what's working for me, what's working for them and just change one or two things. Or, um, but most of the time, so Gary, I haven't been in my corner for a while actually, cause I've been overseas with Santiago, our head coach. And, you know, um, we have a great relationship just as me and Gary have a great relationship in the corner. So they know, I just like it. Like just simple instructions. Um, sometimes I actually crack jokes in the corner. That's just me personally. So I'll look really serious and, and then I'll just say something. And I think sometimes it throws coach off. <laughs> he just doesn't expect it. But, um, yeah, I have a, um, sometimes I'd like lo- having a laugh, but then I need to stay completely focused. It just depends on the day too. Like, yeah. um, but in the corner, yeah, I just like short, simple instructions. Some people like to be yelled at in the corner. Mm. Like, but I'm like, if someone yells at me in the corner, I'm just like, don't talk to me like that. <laughs> it doesn't, it doesn't work. Is there, is there much like mental games then also played? Like you talk about, say, like cracking a joke. So you've probably got a bit of a smile yeah. on your face and when you're looking serious. Like, does a lot of that also come into the head that your competitor can maybe see you and here you are at the end of the round and you you got a smile on your face and that's sort of a bit of playing a bit of mind games with your opponent. Oh, absolutely. I think sometimes like at the end of the day, I think um, sometimes you just have to have fun and yeah. put a smile on your face. Like, um, and it just depends. I guess it's very individual. Some people might just think you're not taking it seriously enough or, you know, but for me, like in the gym, you know, I'm pretty stern in the gym. Like I take my training very seriously, but every now and again, I will crack a joke. So for me, it's normal. If I'm not doing it, maybe it doesn't feel right. So for me, that's normal, but I get for other people, they're just stone cold and they're like, but I leave that for the three minutes. And then that minute I get off, um, you know, I'm preparing for the next round again, but yeah, I think if they saw that, I mean, if I saw my opponent in the corner laughing, I'd be a bit concerned. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's, there's all different levels of strategy and things you could probably do, but yeah, that would that would be one of those ones where you're probably going, why are they laughing? Like, like what's going yeah. on there? And that's so it plays there. I want to just quickly touch on on Tokyo. So you yep. you got injured, I believe, in the lead up to the first qualification. Correct. Then yep. obviously the game gets postponed, and then there's a second qualification, but then COVID. Uh, I mean, what was the injury kind of what happened there and, and how quickly or how long did that take to sort of get over that situation before you were then able to switch focus to Paris? So I was, I think I was doing shoulder sparring with your hands by your side and the idea is to hit and not get hit in the shoulders, like chest and shoulders. Um, 
but your hands are down. So you're only using trunk and foot defense. So it's a good one to, you know, work on that. And I got punched right in the, like just below the collarbone in one of the top ribs. Ouch. And I was like, really like lethargic and really like uncomfortable for days. And I couldn't figure out why. And I actually fainted and I was like, what the hell is going on? Anyway, I, I broke my ribs, I believe like, and it was just, really uncomfortable and so I didn't go to the qualifiers and I don't think I was in the right headspace either to be honest because me I would do the odd fight with broken ribs now like but I actually believe I wasn't in the right headspace for that qualification event I think I was in a time in my life that I was very like I finished school I was very confused where I was in life it was I was still really young I still am really young but I was gonna I say was, you're still young Monique. <laughs> yeah I was I was very young and I think deep down I knew Tokyo wasn't my dream. I think I knew I was meant for Paris. And for some reason I always thought that. Like, um, there, Don't get me wrong, there was a time I was like, yeah, I see myself going to Tokyo. But then for some reason Paris just had my name written all over it. Which Because you, you set that goal, didn't you, by 22 to qualify for the Olympics and you qualified for the Olympics yeah, at 22, right? yeah. I, I told everyone, I said, I'm going to be 22 years old when I qualify for the Olympics. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah. So, I mean, you, you touched on before that you maybe couldn't really watch the Olympics because of, of what happened. But does is it a case of, say, you know, you get back on the horse straight away? Because obviously the unique thing about Tokyo was it was delayed a year, so therefore it's only a three-year yeah. gap until the next Olympics. So, were you quickly absolutely. back ready to I was, go? Absolutely. I trained throughout that whole time. I had that set in mind, but I, we also had Commonwealth Games around mm. the corner. It was like a year later, so, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. So I was like, yep, yeah, Commonwealth Games, let's go. And then um, it, it's a bit of a – that was probably my biggest heartbreak, that one, one of them. That was, that hit me harder than Olympics, to be honest, um, because I think politics played a big part in that. And a lot of people believed I won that fight. I believe I won that fight for the finals in – the Commonwealth Games trials. Um, I, it was just one of those political things that you can't really, um, you don't have a say in, which sucks. Like before the fight, we had an announcement made that these fights were not contested. Even if you think you won, you cannot contest the bout, which is really strange. Um, and I was like, damn, like, wow. Anyway, I went in there and I won the first round. Clearly we went back to the scorecards. They gave it five zero to the other girl. Mind you, this other girl, she was the golden girl at the time. She was my, like my division's golden girl for a very long time. So, and all respect to her. Um, yeah, have nothing against her. She's such a lovely girl and she's one that I grew up watching too. So, um, but I knew I won that fight and, but you know what, that made me hungrier and, I just straight after that, I was, I was running the next day. I wanted to train straight away. I was, yeah, I was really hungry after that. And I was like, you know what, Olympics. And I was like, if I ever fight her again, I'm going to stop her and I'm going to make, make sure everyone knows that that's my division. Um, and I'm here for the takeover. So that was my goal. And you did it. You're here now. And and I did. You're Absolutely. an Olympian. You, you're going. Absolutely. That's, I made um, a promise to myself, yeah. I mean, I'm sure there's so much to unpack in what you're saying with the comment. That's a, that's a different interview, Monique. But, I mean, I, I kind of wanted yeah. to fast forward to that moment then in the Solomon Islands when you, you, you beat Tasman to get through there. I mean, did, did all those sort of emotions that you're talking about, that disappointment of not making Birmingham the Olympics, like because I, I watched the interview with you and, and you were so emotional and it's 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 a, it's a joy to watch. I'm not saying I, I like to see people cry, but like that emotion <laughs> where, you know, you're obviously so overwhelmed with what you've achieved. But was that that moment where things like what you're saying have, are hitting you and you've achieved your dream? Yeah, I think I put a lot of pressure on myself at Solomon Islands to um, – to win and I think I could not explain the pressure after winning the second round five zero I was up on like um on every single court scorecard I just had to have fun in that last round the pressure that was off my shoulders was unbelievable because I, and it was just my self pressure like it wasn't from anyone else um I just knew that this was my destiny and 
like it's just like it could slip through my 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 the palms of my hands at any moment right now so that when i started crying i i'm not a cry i don't cry and when i started crying like i think i was just thinking about everything i was thinking about all the the times in the gym that things didn't go right or fights that didn't go right or the sacrifices that I gave for this sport, the relationships I lost for the sport, the friends I never see, the my family that I never see, the you know, the the moments that I can't get back, but I'm doing this for a reason. And that was the reason. That was that was it. So I, I think I was very emotional and I was very grateful that I've got such an amazing support base, like from coaching staff to um, just to everyone on the team, my dietitian, my, uh, my doctors, my like everyone at the AIS, at ACTAS, at all my sponsors, like, and my friends and family that, you know, don't get angry at me for not seeing them because I'm training or, you know, I, my, my little nephews that I don't really get to see grow up too much. Um, yeah, I think they, they all respect the fact that they know I have a dream and that dream is to be Australia's first female boxer to win a gold medal at the Paris Olympic games. That that's my dream and they respect that and they support me no matter what. So I think that's what was, I was really emotional that I do have that support and I, uh, yeah. And I hope I make everyone proud. Yeah. I think I think they're going to be looking at the TV, going, "There's Auntie Monique uh, going to an Olympic Games." That that's okay that you you miss a couple of days, but I mean, just on what you're saying there, <laughs> so inspirational. But then again, it's it's not done yet because I, I love the quote that I, I read from you. I don't want a track suit. I want a gold medal when it comes wanna, to these I Olympics. A gold medal. You, you're Absolutely. going there to win, aren't you, Monique? Absolutely. That's that's Absolutely. the goal. Which because I mean, we 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 talked about this at Tamarawana that it's um no Australian has ever won an Olympic gold ever in boxing. And when I sort of brought that up to him that he's going to be the first, he then was like, well, I'm not going to be the first. I'm going to be like the third or the fourth because like all my other teammates are going to win because they're, they're bouts are before <laughs> exactly. mine. So, yeah. I mean, he's confident. Like, there's just the level of confidence in, in this team right now, which it's not only a straight, like Australia's biggest ever boxing team. I believe this is the biggest team of any nation at Paris that we've got 12 boxes right. going. I think we have got the most boxes. There's only one we category, do. if I'm not mistaken, that we do not have a boxer in. So I mean, yes. how yes, how but. like how is that to be around teammates? That this confidence level, this massive team, the sport, everything that's going into Paris, that we could break this gold medal drought we've never won. I can't explain to you the the amount of support and the the teamwork and the like the drive that we all have is just incredible in that team. The relationship that we have with one another, like there's a lot of us on a team and I'm telling you right now, every single one of those people, you could, I could go up to any single one of them and sit down and have like a deep and meaningful conversation about anything. I trust them. I love training with them. You can learn so much from each of those, our team members, uh, even s- coaching staff included. They, we have such this diverse, but incredible group of people in that team and being able to train with them every day, it just makes you want to become a better boxer and even a better person. You learn so much from them. You learn so much about their personalities and it's, um, you appreciate it. You appreciate them letting you in and becoming a friend and, um, you know, just like training with some of the best boxers in the world, like in your own backyard, like how crazy is that? That's, it's incredible. So I'm very grateful for that team. And um, you actually get a bit emotional when you have to go home and don't mm. see him for a bit. Yeah. Love hearing that. I love hearing that because it just, it seems like just you're also like, I, I see the social media posts of you guys and, and just everything around it. It just looks such like a good group of people that are sort of yeah. together. And I think just the way the sport has sort of grown and gotten that extra attention since Tokyo with Harry's bronze, I think kind of, you know, it's something seems really different in the world of boxing right now that I've never seen before in the lead up to an Olympics in Australia before. Yeah. I think um, boxing is such an individual sport and it is the loneliest sport. None of those guys on the team are going to be fighting my fighters. I'm not going to be fighting their fight, but they make you 
know that no matter what, we're we're proud of Australia and we're proud of our team. We're proud to represent our country. And I think, you know, um, Harry's a really good example. He loves his country and he lets everyone know. And um, like, as all of us do, um, like, but we're just proud to be together on a team. A lot of us, like I said, we've got such a diverse um, group of people. We've got um, like Islanders. Mm. Um, we've got a lot of like there's Italian. Like, I was going to say, you're, you're, you're Italian, right? Yeah, so, yeah. I have an Italian background. So does one of the other girls on the team. Like, And we've got a um, girl that's Argentinian, like Tiana. Like she's got an Argentinian and uh, Cook Island background. Wow. Um, like Tina. Like we've got such a diverse group of people and I think it's incredible. And to like share different cultures with one another and like I said, it makes traveling, it makes training so easy. Fantastic. I love it. So yeah. were you guys sort of stick together in the lead up to, to Paris? Like were you going to a camp uh, together? Yeah. So we're about to head off to Netherlands and to the UK for a tournament in the Netherlands then uh, training camp in the UK and then we come back home then we all meet up in Brisbane before flying to Germany for the last camp in Germany before Paris wow and you so your first bout will be two days after the opening ceremony are you uh, at this point I believe it's three days three days but it's within yeah. that couple of days but yeah, do you correct. plan to like opening ceremony is that something you're looking at absolutely or is, absolutely yeah? Yeah, I'm not missing that for the world, no. You're going to say that dream, that young girl watching the Olympics, right? You kind of, you want yeah. to, you get it. Because again, I always love, I always love hearing when athletes sort of, even if they're competing very close to that. I just, I always, whenever I hear the swimmers say like, oh, I've got to be up the next morning. And I realize an opening ceremony is like a 10 hour day. I get it. It's a very long day. Massive, yeah. But I mean, you never know if you're ever going to be back at the Olympics. Right. So, yeah, yeah. You never know. So yeah. definitely yeah. grabbing every opportunity I can while I'm there soaking it all in. I think it's so easy to, like, I can't believe how quick the year's gone, to be honest. So well, we're yeah, recording definitely. this in, in the beginning of May, which basically yeah. means we're two months away from the Olympics. Man, that's just. Yeah. 80 days today. 80 it's days insane. Today. 80, you're not, you're not counting at all, are you? <laughs> I'm so excited. <laughs> <laughs> not, not, not counting in the size. I not did read counting. though, the plan though, after the Olympics is to go, go to Italy, like to, to visit family. Is that sort of. Yeah. So after? my family's coming to watch me at the Olympics. So, all five sisters coming, the, the, the kick caboodle, everybody? Oh, I don't know about all five of the sisters. At this point, there's three of them going. Um, my mom's coming, my dad's coming, um, and then family members from Italy are coming wow. to watch. And then we're going to go back. We're going to go to the Amalfi coach, uh, coach, Amalfi Coast. But my family's from Calabria, so we'll have to stop by to see everyone there too. You might get a few freebies with an Olympic gold medal around your neck. You might sort of get oh, some uh, entries into some places and, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, a few. Uh, that's the plan. I'll just wear it like jewellery. Well, I, I keep saying to all our guests that, you know, you do also generally get flown back business class. Like if you want to kind of like quickly come back to Australia for the Welcome Home Parade, just, you know, hey, everyone, Sydney gold medal suite, then get back on the plane to Italy, like a quick detour to, oh, you know, your yeah. adoring fan. I'm sure Queen Bium will have a, you know, they'll, they'll give you the, the key to the they'll city. Give me hopefully a separate show. <laughs> exactly. I reckon they'll just shut, they'll just rename this, they'll rename the town after you basically <laughs> you know it's statue build of you as you come into queenbian there's monique there she is gold medal around the neck bugger off george lazenby you're only bond in one movie who cares mark Webber, you didn't win a world championship no. Monique won an olympic gold medal olympic gold medal that's what it's time for trump's a couple of formula one races come on that's that's, that's what i'm uh, saying a big deal yeah exactly which i mean it's just it's, no, it's, it's awesome the beauty of like these Olympics and everything along those lines. Have, have you had a chance, like, will there be a chance to test out the venue in, in Paris? Like, is there like a test event or anything in the lead up? No, I've heard that it's going to be an incredible setup. Um, but I think, uh, yeah, we won't know until we're there, I guess. But um, look, I'm, I'm really excited for it. We've stayed in some dodgy places before traveling around the world so i'm not too fast i think village is pretty good i think so <laughs> i think so they, they said that they've got like subway there set hey, up so 
There you go. And I mean, long of the every morning. Long of the day is gone of McDonald's being a sponsor and the the queues around the block to eat your your McNuggets, but a Subway yeah, pretty right. good still. Subway is so. pretty good. I've heard um like they've got a barista there, so that's they that's do. all I need. Dedicated yeah. Australian barista, which uh, back in Tokyo, a lot of other countries were trying to sneak into the Australia section to get the free because no other countries had a barista. So I don't blame them. I yeah. don't blame them at all. Yeah, yeah. The, be- the best job in the Olympics is Australian team barista. Just saying. They are the most popular person at the Olympic Games. So, you know, you befriend them very quickly, Monique. <laughs> I you will. Find I out will. who they are. You, you you get to know everything along those lines. If they're we- watching this, send, yeah. send me a message right now. We're right be now. best friends. <laughs> get, get, get Monique's order ready so she just shows up. I'm like, oh, well, you nearly got your gold, so here's your cappuccino. You know, get it just- uh, Almond piccolo. Almond oh, piccolo. Piccolo. Oh, piccolo. Sorry, piccolo. Yeah. Piccolo. Get it, get it ready to go. <laughs> there you go. Uh, Monique, we'd like to close off with a set of get to know yourself questions, which I'll get to in just a moment. Yeah. One thing I've got to introduce you to, though, is our show's mascot. I'd like you to meet Cherry. Oh. So, Cherry. Uh, Cherry, already gold medal winning and a bit of an injury, but he's he's come through adversity. Now, Terry Moana pointed out that you could sit on Cherry <laughs> In between rounds as inspiration, right? So right. I'm trying to trying to get our guests to think like how inspirational could Cherry be for your tilt for gold in Paris? I think very. Right. Very, especially with the injury going on right now. Exactly. Still pushing through. Pushing through. Gold. He's got a you know, band-aid there. He's, he's still yeah. a bit injured, but smile he's always smiling. And I, he's you, smiling. You know? That's all you need. At the end of the day, you just need to smile. Put some gloves on him. I'm sure he could, you yeah. know, get there a ready bit to of go. A head guard. Headgear on. He's ready, there right? There you go. There you go. He's ready. <laughs> so what we're trying to do, we'll, we'll get some, uh, hopefully some pins or something made in the lead up. So we'll get you a yeah. cherry that you can use as a good luck charm. Oh, that'd for be you awesome. In, Hell in yeah. Paris and, uh, you know, get, get put the gold around it. We expect that when Absolutely. we get, get you back on the show afterwards. But Monique, we, we close off. Instead of get to know yourself questions. Now, as always, these are a questionnaire that was given to Team Canada athletes ahead of the Rio and the Pyeongchang Olympics. They write these down and then they post it in and put it on the website. So there is a drawing section if you wish. It's completely optional. Uh, yeah. h- how are your drawing skills? Just quickly Terrible. asking. Terrible. That's even better. Terrible. That's what we like to hear. Uh, but if you feel up to it today and after after this interview, you can send it in to me. You can draw a picture of yourself. You can draw a picture of a teammate and, uh, well, it says Canadian animal as always, but an Australian animal. A so. Canadian animal. Well, you can draw a Canadian animal if you want. <laughs> I mean, you know, bugger yeah, a kangaroo, yeah, draw a moose. Uh, yeah right <laughs> <laughs> why not but uh, optional completely optional but i'll start off with the first question for monique what is your favorite ever olympic moment oh uh god there's a few okay um maybe katie taylor winning a gold medal okay that's I, I like it when we get one that we've never had before so that kind of that connects in there very well. And then, of course, your next one will be you winning an Olympic gold medal. Absolutely. Um, that will trump that one. Uh, if you could choose any Olympic host city, where would it be? Ooh. I don't want you to say Queanbeyan. So, oh. Queen- <laughs> Queanbeyan 2036. Oh, I'd love, I'd love it to be in Gold Coast or yes. even somewhere like... It's like Italy. I'd love to go to an Italian Olympics. That'd be pretty cool. Well, the Winter Games are in less than two years. How are you? How's your skiing or your skating? Never been. There Never you go. Been. Perfect excuse. Olympic gold medals. I'm sure get invited to the Winter Olympics. So I you know. hope so. Yeah, and then Brisbane. By the time you get to Brisbane in 2032, you'll be a two-time Olympic gold medalist. So you got to go for a exactly. three-peat. So you got to go. Gotta home go soil, right? Home soil. Yeah. Um, in your spare time, what do you most like to do? Ooh. Online shop. Online shop? I'm terrible. Shoe shopping. Shoe I'm the shopping. Worst. No, that's a, yeah. is it do you have like a go to, like is it just a website that is kinda of like your home page because you're just always checking out specials or something like that? Oh, uh, I'm um, J D or Foot Locker. Oh yeah. Big ones. Yeah. Yeah. Good ones. Are you like are you a brand? Like are you like a Nike, uh, an Adidas, like It's I'm um, controversial because I like Nike shoes mm-hmm. loving like adidas always comes out with like original goods i think adidas like is unreal but in saying that i'm wearing nike shirts right now so nike and adidas i love uh, them of course for the olympics you'll be wearing volleys right uh because that the uh <laughs> yeah is it a- asics 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 and volley yeah. i think the shoes are yeah. volley asics so uh you know just a, a subtle plug out there for that one the weirdest instruction a coach ever gave you was <laughs> 
Um, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if I can say it. Oh, you can say it um, now. You got to say it now. <laughs> uh, he, a coach, told me once to like hit her in the liver, but he said, "Make her shit her liver." <laughs> and that one. <laughs> that was a good one. That's a good instruction. Um, um, did you achieve but, that? Uh, <laughs> no, I didn't make her shit her liver, but okay. I heard her. I heard her. That's yeah. halfway there. That counts. So. Okay, I like that. That that's a good one. Uh, I think at Team Australia, has, sorry, but Team Australia has a good one. We say bolo, bolo, and we just or, or send it, and it just means send a massive overhand, right? And just try, it. yeah, and it works. So where does bolo come from? What's like that? Like ref- a bowling ball. Like ah, ah, okay. Yeah, I like very Australian. Yeah. We've got to like shorten it down very and add an O yeah. to the end of it. Of course, of course, Ben. Bolo. You've been interviewing too many Canadians on this show. You, you've lost your <laughs> Australianisms. Uh, your favourite workout is? Ooh. Oh. Like, mm, that's really hard. I love sparring. 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 I'm just going to say sparring. Okay. That's a workout. I mean, it's, it's probably it's a very, very important one for a boxer, I can imagine. Yeah, or so. running. I love running. Running. Running's great. Okay. Yeah. I like that. Your favourite sandwich is? Ooh. Italian. Mm. Mozzarella with um, ricotta and honey. Oh, ricotta and honey. Yeah. Wow, that sounds good. Yeah, delicious. And maybe some basil leaves on there. It'd be oh, beautiful. Geez. Even if you switch the meat out with like some salami or prosciutto. Mm. Beautiful. See, 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 no, like, no disrespect to the French and the great food they're going to have in the village. But I mean, if this was in Rome or you know, nothing like, beats Italy. I'm sorry, like Italian come food. On. Oh. Come on. Yes. I mean, yeah, just making me very hungry thinking about it right now. Yeah, me too. <laughs> if, if you could have any superpower, Monique, what would it be? Oh, I think flying would be pretty cool, but you might get cold. That's what I'm thinking. <laughs> but, oh, no, teleportation. Yes. I'd love to teleport. Yes. That way you could come back and do the Welcome Home Parade and then be back in Italy like in five minutes later. Yeah, Easy. not pay for flights and everything too. Probably work in boxing too. I can imagine like as an opponent's trying to like go for it, you could just teleport to the other side and tap her on the shoulder and like, hello, boom, knock her out. Done. Yeah, but I feel like you'd get done for cheating. Nah, yeah. if teleportation exists in the world, I'm sure like it's legal. Yeah, it's allowed. Know? Yeah, should be. Exactly you know? right. Come on. Uh, the best candy in the world is? Oh, damn, that's. Does chocolate count as candy? Yeah, it counts. Yeah, uh, chocolate, but I'm also like I love gelato. Yes, gelato. Yeah, it doesn't count as a candy. I, when I think of candy, I think of like lollies, but um, gelato, chocolate. I'm with you. Two even. It's it's yeah. kind of like I guess it flows into that like junk food category, right? Mm. And yeah, I'm I'm an ice cream man. I love ice cream, so gelato falls into if, that category. So if I was to watch a movie, I'd I'd love gelato mm. chips like. Some sort of chips and oh, pop or popcorn and yes. um, chocolate. Great night. Easy. Yeah, that's, that's a night out. That's all Absolute, you need. That, that's all you need. Simple. Uh, as a kid, your favorite sports team was sports team. Mm. Oh, uh, not by choice, <laughs> um, but. I kind of fell into AFL, the Swans, Sydney Swans. Okay. Um, so, yeah, my teacher loved the Swans and I just was like, yeah, that's so cool. I'm going to support the Swans. <laughs> I mean, as, as somebody originally from Tasmania, Monique is an AFL guy. I like it when people answer AFL on the show. So that yeah. that's good. Are you forced growing up like coming from an Italian household like when the World Cup's on? Do you have to cheer for Italy or Australia? Oh, I'll, I'll always cheer for both. But um, I think... Uh, it's hard. I feel like um, my family, my like close family, don't really watch the World Cup too much, which suck, which sucks because I actually enjoy watching the football. But um, oh, it depends. I'm just uh, thinking I'm you might say, have been. T- I'm going to say Italy. You was going to say, say you, you might be too young to remember 2006, but I'm just thinking back to uh, you know Italy Socceroos Italy. round of 16. <laughs> yeah. I don't really remember it, but I, I do remember it happening, but I don't, mm. yeah. yeah. Um, 
But no, I do think I have to say Italy on that one. You would have liked the end result of that World Cup, though. At least yeah. they, they went on to win it, of course. You touched on movies. Your favourite sports movie is? Ooh, Rockies. Easy. Rocky I, 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 I never oh. want to go to the, the the stereotypical answer for the sport, but, I mean, you've got to answer yeah. it, right? So. Oh, four or five. The one with Drago. I think it's five. Okay. You know, I, yeah. I, I, admission, and I think we talked about this with Terra a few weeks ago, I've never seen Rocky. So. Uh. Yeah, you're going to hang up on me yeah, now. Yeah, no, you, so. you, yeah. <laughs> I've run up the steps. I've run up the steps in Philadelphia. So does that count? So That does count a bit. Okay. That's pretty cool. I All haven't right. done that. So well, there you I go. love Rocky. So. With a gold medal, right? Like, you know, up the steps. <laughs> Rocky didn't win a gold medal, did he? You know? No. So there you go. Uh, if you he could lost live... like 50-50 of his fights. So. <laughs> well, okay then. Well, he's, he, you didn't you only lose like three fights last year? So you're, you're better than Rocky. So. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Just saying, hashtag better than Rocky. Put that on the shirt. Better than Rocky. Rocky. You're yeah, welcome. The you better Italian. The, be- <laughs> the-, the better Italian stallion. <laughs> is it is it tempting to use the Italian stallion as a nickname or is it too cliche? No, it's too cliche. It's, it's too cliche. done for now. Okay. Yeah, no. All right. Just got to ask a question. Uh, if you could live anywhere in the world, where would it be? Italy. Italy. Great. Is there a particular yeah. part of Italy that you like? No, I need to travel a bit more to see. Um, I just love the whole culture there. But in saying that, I've heard good. I need to travel a bit more around the world, like for holidays, more mm-hmm. to say, instead of boxing. So after the Olympics, I plan to go to Portugal, Spain, Greece. Beautiful. And see. But I think Italy, like every time I go back there, it just feels like home to me. Like it feels like I have a connection there, which is Fantastic. really good. Fantastic. I like hearing that. Uh, the last one, I and this, this one is such an open-ended question because you can interpret this however the hell you want, Monique. When you were little, what was one thing you always thought? I could fly. You could fly. Okay. Yeah. I, nice. I was like so convinced that I could fly. I'd, <laughs> but I also believed that I would become a um a well-known sportswoman one day. Like hey. I was going to be known for my sport. Well, I mean, you technically do fly in the ring, right? Like what is it? Float like a butterfly, sting Fly, like, sting, you, yeah. You know, so. Could, could be a butterfly. Hey, that, that works. I, I, that's why I love that question because like, you mm. can answer it like one of the best ones I ever got when I asked that question was I was always hungry. I was a child. I was always hungry, right? You're always hungry as a kid. So you know. I was a, oh, I, oh, I was um I had a sweet tooth as a kid actually, and I loved like lollies, but I was never like overly hungry. Mm. That's a but treat. I'm always hungry now. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> there's a reason for that. <laughs> but you're hungry for gold, Monique. You're I'm hungry. Hungry for gold. Hungry for hungry for gold. Uh, Monique, before we let you go, if people want to follow you between now and, and Paris when you eventually release the shirts. Anything along those lines? Social media. Where can people stay up to date with your journey? Uh, my Instagram is the best one, Monique underscore Sirachi. Give me a follow or um, stay up to date with it all. I. Also would like to use this platform to give a massive shout out to my um, sponsors. So thank you so much for everyone. That's um, Give them another plug. You said them before, but give them, give them more. Yeah. I, we always like to give extra plugs on this show. Go for it. I'll, I've got a list of them. But, Do it. <laughs> um, Read it out. Maz from, Maz from No Limits Groups. You guys are amazing. Reset. Um, you guys keep me um well rested, well recovered for every training center uh, session. Thank you so much. I've got Alpha Fresh. I've got GMD meals that sort out my food for me. Um, I've got uh, my mechanic Gus. Thank you so much. I've got there's more. I know there's more. <laughs> I <laughs> just to- I don't want to take away from your other sponsors, <laughs> but I just you are the first person on this show to ever thank your mechanic, and I love that. <laughs> oh, he's the best. He's the best. I can't thank him enough. He's been with me since the start. Um, everyone that's actually been with me since the start, even um, Benny, you know who you are, you're the best. Um, uh, anyone that I've forgotten, I'm so sorry, but thank you so much to everyone that's supported my journey. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I'm sure you've got uh, between 80 days to to write them all in your hand. So when you win gold and Channel 9 have got that microphone in front of your face with a gold medal around your neck, you can just, you know, 
be more of an audience in this show, Monique. I think you'll be yeah. right then. <laughs> Dave. Dave's another one. Dave. Shout out to Dave. Yes. Thank you, Dave. Shout out to Dave. <laughs> and, and also, we'll get you back on after and uh, we can just dedicate an entire hour for you reading your thanks for these. But I think that, that would be fun. So, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see how that goes. <laughs> Monique, best of luck for you in Paris. We're so looking so forward to seeing you. how it's going. It's a pleasure. And go, go get that gold. Go get it for I Australia. Will. I will. Thank you so much. 